us with a good evening. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, lights are drawing in, aren't they? The clocks have gone back and it's, uh, uh, it's just a bit darker. Uh, a bit earlier now, isn't it? Um, as uh, one of my daughters pointed out, it is cosy. So uh, um, It's good to see everyone here uh, tonight. Um, not many notices this evening. Um, home groups. It's home groups on this week. Um, and of course, for, for lots of us, it's, it's half term. Um, Ben uh, will be away, uh, Ben Satter will be away this week. Um, next Sunday we have Dave Stott and Eric Brammel uh, preaching uh, with us uh, next Sunday. Um, ben Midgley will be around uh, this week, but, uh, but it, is, it is half term in their house too, so if you do need him, maybe give him a ring um, uh, if you do need to get hold of him. Just a few, um, a few verses as we, uh, as we start uh, tonight. Um, Psalm 95 tells us, For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. You know, and you can think of so many uh, passages of scripture and, and Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, so much of, of God's word pointing us to who he is and how awesome, how wonderful our God is. And then a few verses from Isaiah. See, the, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their con constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Just um, as we, uh, we're going to be carrying on in our series in Romans and uh, we look forward to Ben uh, coming to teach us. And God, teaches, he treats us as grown-ups, doesn't he? You know, he reminds us of the things that we need reminding of of exactly who he is, of what he has done. He takes us to places which are sometimes uncomfortable, sometimes challenging, his wrath and justice and our condition, our need for a savior. But a savior we have. Let's pray uh, to our great God. So Heavenly Father, you reminded us this morning of the importance of of true worship, how we turn our hearts to you. And you remind us time and time again of who you are, of the awesomeness and the, the greatness of, of who you are and all that you have done. And Father, uh, we respond to you with our hearts tonight with praise, with, with thanksgiving. Uh, we, we turn to a God who is above all, all else, anything that be, can be possibly called a god or an idol and built up, you alone stand apart. You alone are sovereign. You have made everything. You hold everything. Our lives are in your hands. And you will always do right. You will always be just. You cannot go against your good character, your good nature. And your heart is a heart of love and of compassion. And how many of us tonight have known that compassion in our lives. And so, Father, be with us, lead us as we worship you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, let's uh, sing our first song together, all creatures of our God and King.
reminded of that, uh, those passages in Revelation that talks about all of creation praising the Lamb and raising Him up, all angels, thousands and thousands of them, all living creatures in heaven and earth. Uh, that's where we're heading, isn't it? Um, so our reading tonight, uh, Romans chapter 1. So in the Blue Church Bibles, page 1,128. We'll start reading from verse 16 through to verse 25. So Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 and through to 25. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's turn to our God. Heavenly Father, you are forever praised. We know that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that to your glory. Tens of thousands of angels will worship you un, unhindered. Saints from all of history, believers, um, young, old, great, and small, all will be there to worship you unhindered, uh, full and perfect in our response to you, in our praise. We will see you face to face, uh, no more uh, barriers of sin and of the, the curse and the fallenness of this world, all will be, will be gone forevermore and we will be with you in that state of, of worship and of closeness, of oneness. Heavenly Father, we do praise you for, for your invisible qualities, those divine uh, characteristics that you have um, we are overwhelmed when we think of, of all that you have made. And we now know in, in our society and, and modern life more than uh, our forefathers ever knew about from the smallest atom of, of particles and, and of physics and of the laws of this, this universe to the greatest constellations of stars and the vastness of this universe. It is all in your hand. All of it screams out that there is a designer behind everything. There is purpose. There is meaning. We ourselves are wonderfully and fearfully made, Father. Uh, we, we, we understand very little about ourselves as, as human beings, such as the complexity of, of life. And yet you know us. You know everything there is to know us. You know be us better than we know ourselves. And so, Father, we, we praise you. But even these things pale when compared to the glory that is your gospel, 
the glory that is your heart of who you are, the love that you have shown to come to this world in the person of Jesus, to lay everything aside, be treated so cruelly, to face uh, wrath on himself, to die in our stead. And Father, that you forgive us so freely, so ready to forgive all of our wrongs and to, to proclaim that we are righteous before you because of Jesus, that we could know uh, a hope of eternity, an eternity with you, that you turn our eyes from other things towards yourself. Father, we, we thank you for, for saving us. Father, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for when we get it wrong, for when we let you down and let one another down so, so much. Help us change our hearts, Father. Help us to, to learn more about who you would have us be. Help us to more clearly reflect Jesus to those around us. Would you produce in us, uh, uh, in, in us obedience, fruit of obedience? Um, would you help us to, to have that same heart that you have for this world towards one another uh, in our families, in, amongst our friends, our work colleagues, but, but also here in church life? Help us to serve one another, to love one another deeply and from the heart. And Father, as we, as we think about our world, we, we watch the news and our hearts break as we, as we see wars and, and suffering and death and such hatred. And we think of Israel and, and Palestine and we see a situation that is, is so awful and so uh, dreadful and seemingly so endless father it is not beyond you to bring revival uh, to both palestinians and to to israelis that you would save them that they would stand together side by side as brother and sister in christ father it, if it is possible we we pray that you would bring not only peace but but your peace to to that land and to their lives and we pray for for ukraine still uh, for for Turkey, for Syria, for Sudan, for Yemen, for Libya, for Morocco. And Father, it is just one thing after another. The whole of creation groans in frustration, uh, suffering the effects of the fall and the curse of this world. Father, uh, we pray that you would bring peace. Um, we look forward to, to your return, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, bring, uh, bring an end to all this, the suffering, the war, the strife. Bring peace, um, bring love, bring, bring the world that we all want, uh, we pray. So, Father, as, as we seek to, to worship you tonight, we pray for, for Ben. Um, pray that you would draw near to him and give him uh, an assurance and a confidence in your word. Um, speak to our hearts, Father, as we listen. You know each one of us, you know our circumstances, you know the pressures and the struggles uh, that we face, each and every one of us. So speak to us, change us, mold us to be more uh, of the people that you would have us be um, in Christ Jesus. Help us to worship you tonight in, in spirit and in truth. We give you all the praise, the glory, the honor, the power, the strength. It is all yours forevermore. Amen. We'll sing our, our second song together, uh, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me, uh, after which uh, Ben will come up and, and teach us from, from Romans.
I've just walked past uh, somebody with their Bible open in Romans, and the amount of markings and underlinings in that book. We are in Romans. We are in Romans. What a book it is. A uh, great source of help and comfort it's been to God's people for, well, we praise the Lord, don't we? Friends, um, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, um, which is the umbrella organization that we as a church uh, belong to, uniting evangelical Christians around the country. It's not the only organization that does that, but it's one of them and the one we belong to. Um, and the director is John Stevens. Uh, John Stevens uh, does a kind of um, sterling job, generally keeping FIC up to date with developments. He was a former lawyer, so he keeps his eye on a lot of legal things. And um, they do a podcast about once a week, you know, updating the church, particularly church leaders, about events going on. And the, and the last one that just came out, John Stevens was talking about the conversion therapy ban, which is a law um, that was knocking around a few years ago, but never kind of got the political clout behind it to get it passed. Um, and it seemed to have just fizzled out. But it's been sort of revived, and there's a fresh interest in trying to bring it to the parliament and bring it about. And he was just pointing out that, and he just made this sort of passing comment, really, that you know, ch chapters like Romans chapter 1 were going to become difficult chapters for, for the church to, to preach on, uh, in terms of preaching on it well, preaching on it faithfully, um, and that people could find themselves getting in deep water for, for preaching some of the content of Romans chapter 1. I suppose what I'm highlighting here is that we are living in times which have, we've enjoyed for a, for a very considerable period of time, a, a situation where the laws of the land are very comfortable uh, to the practice of the Christian faith. Uh, you don't find yourself getting in hot water very often for just practicing the things that are taught in Scripture. But increasingly, I think probably the first thing here in Wales was when we had the smacking ban here in Wales. Uh, by the way, this is not saying that Christians, our greatest desire and passion is to smack our kids. That's not our primary interest. What, what I'm saying is that for the first time, you've got something in Scripture that says something is permissible, and then the law of your land is saying it's not permissible. So for the first time, you've got a kind of convergence, a, some sort of a, a kind of a conflict of interest, if, I, if you can put it like that, between what the Bible says and what, what this culture is saying. And as our culture begins to diverge away from its Christian heritage and roots and becomes more and more mixed and diverse in its nature and character, I suppose we shouldn't be surprised to find that this becomes a more frequent occurrence. Now, I mean, this bill that I've just mentioned hasn't passed. It's just out there somewhere. But the fact that it's being discussed is, an, is indicative, I guess, of the shift in our society and the way that the direction of travel that the Christian church are on and the direction of travel that the, the culture we're living in is on is going to be increasingly sort of, you know, knocking heads and, and, and clashing into each other. So he, he was saying that there's going to be a point where it might, there might be legal reasons why some of the contents of Romans chapter 1 might be difficult to preach on. And the reason I want to preach on it is not so I can avoid getting arrested when the law comes in, if it ever does. That's, I'm not trying to avoid that. I'm doing it because Romans chapter 1, and in a way, some of the content we're going to get into in the next few weeks, it's where a culture and the gospel are beginning to rub up against each other and knock up against each other, that's exactly where we should be talking. These are the issues where our society, our Christian society, and the wider society that we're living in, this is where the kind of the rubber is hitting the road. So like in rugby terms, they say you've got to put your head in where it's hot. And uh, that's basically what we're talking about doing. Getting into Romans chapter 1 is really putting our head in where it's hot. So Perhaps if you've uh, listened to Romans chapter 1 being read to you so far, you'll realize that there's some significant issues that's going to be raised. Now, I'm going to just talk on one verse tonight. That's Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And I uh, want to draw your attention to that. Uh, and, just, and just say this, that in the preceding 17 verses, which we have you know, endeavored to look at at least in part, 
what we've seen there is, as it were, the apostles' opening remarks, his greetings, his opening remarks, his, his uh, first engagement with the people to whom he's writing. He's writing from Corinth in, in Greece. He's writing across the waters to Italy, to the church that's based there in Rome. It's a church that's been going through a pretty torrid time, uh, a church that's been in a situation of weakness in a very big metropolitan urban society that is wholly opposed in its values and its mindset towards the faith that they, are, they believe in and they hold to. And that society has been sort of making efforts to silence the church by causing them to feel ashamed of their beliefs. You're, you're un-Roman, you're, 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 you're unpatriotic, you're, you're foolish, you're, you're unwise, you're, you're going on a dangerous journey, you're falling in with the wrong people, those kind of ideas, undermining people's confidence. And I suppose that is responded to when the apostle, and we've heard it tonight, responds with, I am not ashamed of, of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And the apostle, as he writes this letter, he's writing as somebody who knows what it is to have people try to silence him. He knows what it is to find that people have tried to make him feel foolish and ashamed and embarrassed of his faith and try to get over on him in that regard. And that hasn't worked. And he knows what it is for people then to go to the next stage of resort and try to intimidate him, the use of force and violence. He's been beaten up. He's been, uh, people have hurled stones at him. He's been left for dead already once. He's gone through all sorts of physical intimidation, but that hasn't silenced him either because there's something bigger on the inside of him, the passion that he's got about this gospel, that he keeps overcoming these obstacles. He's also experienced legal censure. He's seen in certain situations, he's been put into prison, he's been accused of wrongdoing, and he's been flogged uh, on the basis that what he's done is against the law. That hasn't stopped him either because he's absolutely convinced that this is a misapplication of the use of law, that this is a grotesque use of force to try and silence people from projecting their genuine beliefs and convictions. He also is clearly not ashamed of the gospel that he preaches. So he writes this letter, these opening remarks, is really just to engage with the church who's been going through this as a, as a man with a great deal more experience of suffering as a Christian to strengthen them. And he's gone to um, one of the books in the Old Testament uh, to find a text that he can use to preach, I guess, the gospel to this group of people in Rome. And he goes to the book of Habakkuk. You're familiar with this. I've been here on Sunday evenings. Habakkuk 2 describes somebody who has gone through a very torrid day. And you can say there's something apocalyptic about what is taking place there. A kind of sense of the presence of evil at, at work, let loose, on the rampage, violence of unspeakable violence, monstrous, monstrous events, atro atrocities, atrociousness, things that you can hardly bear, days that are so hard, so tough. You, you just don't know what will bring, every day will bring you people living in abject terror, absolute terror. I, I, is that fair enough to say when you think of the word apocalyptic, that's the kind of thing you think of? And there is a sense that that is relevant to what is being said here in Romans 1.18 when he says the wrath of God is apocalypto from heaven. But more properly, the word apocalypse has this sense of being. So, okay, some of you, I'm sure, cultu cultu cultured people here go to the theater. The theater. And when you go to the theater, perhaps you have, an, there's an overture. The, the musicians strike up and play an overture. And they play through all the pieces of music, the melodies of all the pieces of music that you're going to hear on the stage being sung by the cast. And in that sense, what the, that overture gives you an insight into what is you're about to receive. It, you might, perhaps if you're on uh, YouTube, you might be thinking of going to the cinema sometime, maybe over the half term, thinking of going to the cinema, and along will come a preview, and it'll give you, it'll show you who's in the film, and whether it's an action film, or whether it's a, a romance or a drama. What kind of thing is this? It gives you a preview, a prelude 
of what's going on. Maybe you pick up a book in the bookshop. You're going to sit down and read a book, and you read the blurb on the back, and it tells you the content of what you're about to re read if you open up the pages of this book. These, this word, apocalypto, is quite literally the pulling back of a curtain. You know, perhaps you go along to see your grandchildren or your children in the, in the school play, and you can, the, you can see the curtain moving slightly, and you can hear tittering and, uh, and, and people scratching furniture in the background behind there. You've got a sense that the performance is about to begin, and you have a sense that, like you're through the curtain, you get a perception of what's, what's ahead, what's to come. That's the sense that is being used here. So when Paul is saying the wrath of God is being revealed, he's saying there's a prelude, a preview of something that is still to come. And heaven, praise the Lord for heaven, in, it, for in heaven's goodness, because heaven is where every good and perfect gift comes from. If heaven reveals something to us and shows us something before it happens, praise God that we're being forewarned, because forewarned is forearmed, isn't it? God wants us ready. God wants people ready for what is to come. Okay, what is to come? We have to look at the word wrath, don't we? The wrath of God. That's what's up ahead. That's what's in the future. That's what being, is being previewed. That's what's being given a prelude to. The wrath of God. Now, I'm only a, li a little fragile human being, and my emotional range is only yay big. But I know that every one of us, every human being here, we are made in the image of God. And your emotional, internal experience of life is patterned on the life of God. So let me ask you, anybody here ever been angry? <laughs> That's quite an interesting, warm response to that question going on. You felt the emotion of anger. Have you ever felt anger at injustice? Have you ever been appalled by something? Have you ever been outraged by something? Have, has ever something sh negative, terrible, evil, wicked happened that has turned you inside out and shaken you to your to your boots. Now, on the internet now, I'm told that so psychologists who do the kind of observation of this kind of thing, they study the responses people make to various posts up online. And the number one human emotion that gets tugged by the internet more than any other human emotion is not love and compassion or laughter or joy, it's outrage. Outrage is a very, very powerful emotion. And in a way, when we talk about this human emotion of outrage, we're tapping into something of the very person of God upon whom our very beings are patterned and made to be like in some perhaps broken and, and shallow sort of way. So what we're pointing out here, the wrath of God, if we're having a revelation, a foretaste of this, of the internal emotional experience, if I can put it like that, of Almighty God. And as we behold God in that sense, the emotion that we see there is wrath. Wrath. I think maybe if I was looking for an adjective, more, a more contemporary adjective, it might be fury. God's fury. His outrage. His anger. His indignation. And the thing about all of this is that this is not just the kind of, I mean, we've all been there where we felt angry, okay? But sometimes anger boils over, and it cannot be restrained and should not be restrained and actually produces action. Some people act in anger, and using their anger, they destroy things in their wrath and in their anger. 
something so wicked, so bad, so offensive, so difficult that they have to literally just ruin it and collapse it and erase it if at all possible because it is so hostile to their sense of what is right and what is wrong. And this is the wrath of God. It's not just a, a passive emotion. It's an emotion that produces this outburst of what I can only call unfettered violence. Unrestrained violence. And we're thinking about God here. So, I, one of the terms that gets attached to God is that he is almighty. All, my, all this might, all this power, just consider it, all the might and power of God, the God who made the universe and everything in it, focused in pure, unfettered range on some object that is of such distaste to him that he is determined to smash it and destroy it and ruin it and remove it utterly and completely from his pristine and beautiful creation that he loves. What is it? What is it? Next question. <laughs> in my, in, my, uh, in the, the, the Bible I've got up here, you know, the NRV's put various headings in. It says, God's wrath against mankind. <laughs> well, I'm very glad to say that's not Scripture. <laughs> That's a rather um, poor um, subheading there. Perhaps if you've got an NAV, it says God's wrath against sinful mankind or something like that, maybe. But we're told in Romans 1.18 what the object of his wrath is. All this ungodliness. All ungodliness. All of it. If we say godliness, what is godliness? Godliness, I think it's fair to say, is a contraction of the phrase godlikeness. Now, none of us are going to be like God in the sense that we're never going to be almighty and all-knowing and all-wise and all ever, ever present, although some people do try. When we're talking about godliness, we're talking about his patience or his kindness, or his grace and his forgiveness, his forgiving qualities, his forgiving nature, um, his generosity. All of those are, are godly things, aren't they? And I hope everybody here in this room is, is committed and signed up to the pursuit of godliness, <laughs> To be more like God in all of this, in these ways. But, you know, just let me speak for myself. I, as I look into my own heart and I look at my own life and I look at some of my actions and some of my attitudes, I would love to tell you that I find no ungodliness in me. But I don't. That's not true. I find ungodliness here. And if I can find it, and I am a very small little man, how much more does God see and know the ungodliness in me? And let me tell you, I'm not just talking about me, because I think this might also be true of you. I'm sorry to break it to you if you're not aware. The ungodliness, and God hates all ungodliness. He hates it. He hates it. And not, he doesn't just passively hate it. He sets out with absolute commitment and determination to destroy it utterly and completely, to smash it to bits, to collapse it in our lives. God would have you holy. Now, maybe you've had the experience of being refined in the Father's fire. Maybe you know something of what it is to discover some of the ungodliness in you and have the Lord God in his mercy and love bring that to your attention and show you your sin 
and you've had some sense, some feeling of just God's hatred for that which is in you. And he has brought his power to bear on that thing. And maybe perhaps in your experience, by God's grace, he's purged it out of your life. And you've changed. This is the process we call sanctification, isn't it? We have been set apart for God, but gradually over the period of the Christian's life, as you're exposed to the Word of God and affected by the Spirit of God, I hope every one of you, you're changing. We pray, don't we? Make me more like Jesus. Make me godly. Do a work in me. Here I am. Because in, at least in some small part, if you don't see how much God hates your sin, how offensive and utterly offensive it is to him, I suspect that we're going to just basically downplay it and kind of imagine that we can just rub along with our attitudes and not feel the urgency to change. And it's not the only incentive for change that the gospel gives us, but certainly it's one of them. But just think about all the people for whom godlessness is not just something that they're aware of and uncomfortable with and endeavoring to repent of and live separate from. Just think of all the people for whom the pursuit of ungodly things and ungodly actions and ungodly pursuits is their chief end in life. So if we're saying godliness is things like kindness, what about the people who, who, unkindness, they think that unkindness is the way to live. If being forgiving is the Christian way, what about those people thinking un, being unforgiving is the way to live? If being merciful is the Christian way, people who think being merciless is the way to live. Just think of those people who are absolutely committed and dedicated to living in such a way in which God has no room and no place. They're not living for God. They reject God. They don't believe in God. They don't respect God. They've got no time or interest in God. They are ungodly. And then you think about the wrath of God against all ungodliness. And a verse like this issues a clarion warning. That this is a prelude. This is what's coming against all ungodliness. Let me just use an illustration if I can. I'm sure all of you understand exactly what I'm saying, but let me just make an illustration anyway, just in case. Imagine, if you will, a group of villains. They're a hardened lot, and they want some money. So they saw off the ends of their shotguns, and they buy themselves little stubby pistols, and they get themselves together, and they get themselves a hideout. And they scout out a bank, and they think they see a loophole that they can break through the out, all the defenses and get inside this bank. And they plot it all out, and then one of these days, they, they do it. They break through all the defenses. They break into the bank. They start shooting here, there, and everywhere. They shoot a couple of people just to terrify everybody in the bank, get people into submission, grab a couple of hostages, just in case, for insurance purposes, that is. They break into the vaults. They take the money. They put it all in their bags, in their balaclavas, and they just leave the building with their hostages and their booty uh, in tow. And they head back to the den. They head back to their, their hideout. But of course, people have been smart and they've marked some of the notes and there are some tracker devices and so it becomes quite clear to the police and the authorities where this hideout is. And so they, they, they start to amass a big police presence and SWAT teams and they start to surround the house. They're all there inside with their guns and their terrified hostages and they're counting their money and thinking they've got away with it. And then outside, they hear a voice saying, come out, you're surrounded, this is the police, lay down your weapons, put your hands on your head, kneel down on the ground, 
and come out slowly, come out slowly. Put your hands where I can see them, come out slowly. This is the police. Now, put yourself, because I know you can all identify with villains. You look like a villainous lot. What, what do you do? What do you do? You sit there and you calculate, don't you, for a moment. What am I going to do here? Can we fight our way out of this one? What if we, we take the hostages? Can we use them as bargaining? Can we get ourselves out somewhere like that? I'd rather be shot than spend the rest of my life in prison and go out like one of the villains that I am. People will respect me for at least trying. Should get escape with the money? Or how many of you are starting to think maybe the best thing I can do is surrender? There's a force out there. I can't see them. But I can hear the message. I'm being warned in advance of what's coming. I'm going to put up my hands and I'm going to say, as every British villain ever does on the old TV programs, it's a fair cop. And I'm going to let them put on the cuffs and lead me away to face justice. To face justice. This, I'm trying to use this illustration to, to square. The difference between God's hatred for sin, which is so clearly taught here in chapter 1, verse 18, and yet our deep, deep conviction that God loves sinners, doesn't he? He loves sinners. And the moment you throw down your ungodliness and you get rid of your unrighteousness and you surrender to God and face Him and admit your sin and confess it to Him and distance yourself from it, all that power, all that force that is there, ready to drive you into the ground and smash you into pieces, is halted. And you have the opportunity of facing justice. You have the opportunity of Facing your maker in justice. So, what are we saying? <laughs> this, this, this message that's coming from heaven, this gracious message that is coming from heaven, warning people not just about the, how awful sin is in the eyes of God, but for those who are still attached to their sin, committed to their sin, unrepentant of their sin, just Repent now, the time is running out. Because the wrath of God is being revealed against all unrighteousness, all ungodliness. So just separate yourself from it. Repent of these things. I just want to point one other thing out, if I may, and it's this. The, the whole statement that we've just read tonight. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness. That statement is not a single child. It's a twin. And if you go back to verse 17, you'll see that just as we've had this revelation that's come from heaven of the wrath of God, in verse 17, we have a, another revelation that we've already seen. For in the gospel... A righteousness from God is apocalypto. So there are two revelations. There are two offers. There are two things coming out from heaven. Two words, two messages coming out from heaven. There's the wrath of God on the one side. And there is this righteousness that comes from God on the other side. I still find it absolutely staggering that when Jesus was crucified, on the one hand was a man who, both of them were criminals, both of them clearly sinners. One of them reviled Jesus to his face, and he evidently experienced the wrath of God. And the other confessed his sin to Christ and pleaded with him for mercy and found grace and righteousness just through the simple act of faith in God's Son. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And it seems these two twins here, these twin revelations, which look like two different things, the offer of the gospel on the one hand and the warning about the wrath of God on the other, look like two separate things. But I want to show you one place 
where both of those things happen at the same time and in the same place coming from heaven. I guess most of you will know what I'm about to say. There is a hill far away on which the Savior bled and died. And in that moment, we see the good news of Jesus Christ, don't we? We see Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what is he experiencing there and then on the cross? Why, why is he suffering so as he is? In that moment, Jesus is experiencing the wrath of God. This wrath of God that's been revealed from heaven is being visited on the Lord Jesus. And what this means for every repentant sinner is that not only is the wrath of God revealed against your sin, but if you'll repent of your sin, you may be thinking to yourself, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in some dingy prison for the rest of my days and face justice for the things that I've done. No. If you will believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and put your trust in him, through Christ, God is prepared to forgive your sin and visit the punishment you deserve on him. And Christ is willing to come to earth from heaven in order to experience the wrath of God on your behalf so that the Father, his Father instead of condemning and judging you rightly as you should be condemned and judged, will adopt you and take you as his very own child. He will treat you as one of his own family, and he will bestow all the blessings, all the inheritance of heaven upon you just as if you were the Lord Jesus yourself. He will love you with an everlasting love. And he will be a father to you. And all the ways that you've lived in former times, taught by your father, the devil, he will cut you off from that. And he will take you as, your, as his own son. And he will teach you. He will train you. He will disciple you. He will bring you up. He'll treat you as your own. And he'll make a man or a woman of God out of you. So that's the choice. That's the choice that we're being presented with. Because the wrath of God has been poured out on Jesus Christ. So that it should not have to be poured out on you. And that is the prelude. That is the premonition that we're being shown here. What happened on the cross tells us what is going to happen on the very last day. When Christ comes to judge the world, either the wrath of God is going to be visited on you in its all, all of its power because of your ungodliness and sin, or you'll be like one of those who will be able to say with confidence, Christ is has taken it all. He has borne the brunt. He has absorbed the wrath of God. And all that there is for me now is blessing and forgiveness and acceptance and grace. How is the wrath of God revealed from heaven? Revealed through his word, isn't it? Not through just Romans chapter 1, verse 18. You'll find it all the way through the Bible. God hates sin. He hates it. And he's determined to destroy it and remove it from his creation. And it's going to happen because he has all the power. And that's what the Bible tells us. There's a book. God has written a book. So if you don't know that, it's here in the book. And people need to make sure they get a copy and have a good read and find out about the wrath of God and what he loves and what he hates. He loves faith. And he hates all ungodliness, all of it. But another way that the wrath of God is revealed is not just through the Scriptures, but through the testimony of people who've actually experienced this. 
And I trust that there's people here in this room who know exactly what we're talking about. Perhaps you know what it is to have your sins forgiven. That Jesus died for you. And you know God is a fearsome enemy and a wonderful friend. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. How is the world, how is this revelation going to get out into the world through the scripture and through the testimony of God's people? Through the gospel being preached. This gospel that Paul is beginning to preach here in the beginning of Romans. It's not just there, is it? You see, the wrath of God already has begun to develop in the, on the face of the earth. All the wicked things that you see, all the awfulness, that sense of like all the terrible things that people do, and they think they're doing the right thing, don't they? Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing. But you see the misery that it produces, the hardship, the pain, the suffering that it all produces. And you can tell, can't you, that in some way, this is some terrible judgment. The earth seems to be cursed. We've got this wonderful planet with all these wonderful resources. And yet we just make such a, a hell out of this paradise. There are places on earth right now. It must be like living in hell. It's something hellish. And that hellishness is a prelude, a preview of a, a real hell that you don't experience on this earth. If that's how bad it can get here, the Lord spare each and every one of us from what lies beyond. But the ultimate way, the ultimate way the wrath of God is revealed is when we see in the person of Jesus Christ, carrying your sin and mine on himself, bearing the punishment that our sins deserve, the wrath of God visited on Jesus Christ so that you and me can escape. It's an amazing thing to think about. What do we need saving from? What do you need saving from? You need saving from your sin, obviously, don't you? You need saving from your sin. Why does your sin matter so much? Because it's so offensive to God. In a funny sort of way, you need saving from God, from the wrath of God, so that you might enjoy his pleasure and love forever. These are the things that Jesus Christ has done for us. We're going to sing to close. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, and my song. And he is, isn't he? He is. Without him, where would we be without Jesus Christ? What hope would we have without Jesus Christ? Can you fight God and win? Surrender. Surrender to Jesus Christ and let him take the penalty your sins deserve.
As we dismiss, Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to look into heaven and see the Lord Jesus there alive, our great high priest interceding for us, standing in the gap for us, pleading his own blood for us. And thank you that his prayers, his sacrifice is perfectly acceptable in your sight, our Father. And that through him, we have come to find the forgiveness of our sins and a new life. We praise you for this and we ask, Lord, that this revelation that you have afforded us might be afforded to countless hundreds and thousands and millions of others that people might press into your precious kingdom and escape the judgment that is still to come. We ask, Lord, that you be very merciful and kind and send your spirit to make the gospel live in people's hearts. Make it live in ours, afresh and anew, we ask. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.